Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. How you doing, baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show, brought to you by Miller Lite, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the Gibby Show. I'm John Arezzi. Joining me, the two-time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, member of the 1986 New York Mets, best-selling author, the man who always tells it like it is, and back from another trip up north in Canada. And direct now from San Antonio, Texas, the baseball life from self, Mr. John Gibbons. Gibby, how are you this week? John, Johnny, doing good. Yeah, you know what? I went up the north, Weyburn, Weyburn, Canada. Don't ask me where that is exactly. But the great white north isn't so white anymore, man. The sun was out. It was hot. And I think I got I think I got sunburned actually watching them. The, uh, it's in the Western Canadian Baseball League. The yeah. team out there did a little banquet. Had, had a blast. But the travel home for crying out loud was, you know, you got to, it took me three flights to get there, ended up in Regina, and then to get flight got canceled in the small airport. And then I went to Toronto for a night and then back home. So when I got home, man, it tastes like Miller time, brother. You yeah, don't think I had a couple? It had a taste like Miller time. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, it's not a straight shot up there for sure. And then when you get cancellations thrown into the mix, but I guess the good part of it is you met a lot of really great young men up there. At this, oh, uh, yeah. at these events, yeah, they you know good young ball players. Uh, you know the the sport in Canada. You know the the players just keep getting better and better. Remember, it used to be just uh, basically all hockey. You know, and the, mm -hmm. you couldn't play baseball unless you played hockey. All that stuff. But you know, the players coming out of Canada are really good, man. And it's uh, they they love the sport up there, and it's uh, just a good bunch of guys, very respectful young men. You know, and they on the team on the. Uh, the uh, summer league team, you know, there's most a lot of Canadian players on there, but there's a few from the U.S. So it's really, a, really a great league that they put together out there, and it's it's been su very successful. A lot of good players have come out of there. Well, I'm sure it was a great trip for you, uh, with the exception of the travel. Uh, but let's talk about today's show. Uh, we will be discussing, unfortunately, another meltdown by Jay starter Alec Manoa. Uh, it seems like we're now at the tipping point and what can be done by the organization to fix this young man. Uh, also on today's show, and we're really looking forward to this, uh, on Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons, Jay's announcer, former manager, Buck Martinez is going to join John. Uh, we're going to have another Roast and Toast inspired by our friends at Miller Lite as well. But let's get right into the Gibby show with the leadoff. John, it was sad to watch uh, this latest meltdown by Alec Manoa. And you have to, you know, you have to feel for this young man. And he seems to be in kind of this tornado now of the press, the media. He's trying to handle it well. Schneider's doing his very best to to really to, to get his back to but it's at the point now after the performance against the Astros where he gave up uh, six runs in the first inning couldn't get out of the first inning pitched a third of the inning something is terribly wrong with him and uh, what you know what do you think can fix this is it time for the front office now to step in and say he can't he can't pitch again maybe we need to send him down yeah, you know, they're scratching their heads up there. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we on the show know Alec. We had him on last year. He's a wonderful young man. He's uh, He's been very successful in the big leagues. He just, you know what, he hit – he's he's going through right now with a lot of great players. And uh, I'm sure Buck will tell us some about some later. What they've been through, it's, it's a tough level to play at. And I think it's gotten to the point now, you know, where he, he just continues to struggle – because he's still a young kid, you you got to salvage. You got to make, make sure you, you save this up here, right? So maybe time to send him down uh, and to just fill in with however you're going to do it. You know, uh, regardless, and, you know you got to you got to think of Alec, um, and he'll be back. It's, a lot of good ones have been through it. It's not unusual guys go to the big leagues and they go back and forth a few times. That's part of it. But I think what happens if it keeps trending this way, you know, it's going to be that much tougher, right? Because he's, he's kind of, he he could tell you all he wants is. is confidence is, is still there but he's a human being man. he's a wonderful human being you know that's that's what happens in the, in the game of baseball it's so hard to play yeah he uh you know he said in his post-game interview that uh the good thing is uh, the teammates love him 
the fans still love him. He heard a smattering of booze, but not a major amount of booze. I think everyone, I think everybody's heart is really out for him right now. To they know how great the guy is. He's proven it in the last couple of years. Uh, his workload has increased, obviously, but uh, he was a Cy Young candidate last year, and this year it just hasn't come together. And each time you go out there and you have a really bad start and things don't go your way, uh, it can get to you. It could affect you mentally a little a little bit. And in this case, seeing Alex, uh, Alex uh, post-game interview, it was, uh, was kind of difficult to watch because he has he seems deflated and he's searching for the answers just like everybody else's for him. Yeah, I mean it's, that that big league level is a cruel level, man, and it uh, that's why it takes the, the the best players in the world to, to to be successful at that. And the guys that do it year after year and have long careers, you know, it, it's it that's what you know. It's hard to explain what, what, what makes him so good because it's it's so difficult. But he'll sur- he'll survive this. But they need need to figure it out. And maybe you know they they they're trying to do that. But maybe the best thing to do is send him down, give him a couple starts in to let let him get away from it, let him hide a little bit. Uh, and, and see where that goes because he'll be back. Yeah, and then you see, you know, obviously Dusty Baker and the and the Houston Astros world champions. I mean, they knew going into this uh, game that uh, he was having some uh, difficulties. They knew what was going on, and they went right after him. I mean, when when you see uh, when when Pena uh, dropped that bunt in the first inning and it rolled down there, and Alec even tried to you know sway it to go into foul territory it seemed like the Astro just like just jumped aggressively on him they knew that he was having some hard times but they uh they they wanted to they wanted to, to take him out yesterday hey you're, hey you're getting i don't care who you're, you're getting no sympathy in the big leagues from those other no. other teams now you know this is all about winning this is all about the um in uh you know, actually, other 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 players love seeing it too because they're going to exploit you, and, and that that helps them. And uh, but in the end, though, everybody's rooting for the human being, right? But uh, yeah. performance on the field, they 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 want to beat you. And the they're, they're 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 world champs for a reason now. Yes, they are absolutely. Uh, in, in your history as a manager, do you have any uh, any similar story that you could share about a guy that really was having a very difficult time, someone who was performing very well, and then the bottom falls out for whatever reason? And and how did you handle that? Roy Halladay was sent down all the way to A ball one time to reinvent himself, and and um, but I've sent many guys down that weren't of uh, Alex's care. Uh, level right the quality yeah. the, the player he was um it, because it, you know it that's not uncommon they go back and forth but this is a little bit different situation because he could have won the Cy Young last year so but sooner or later you got to do what's best for the kid and the team you know you gotta uh you know you can't keep running them out there you know is is uh you know it's because it's a contending team the team is supposed to win it all but you also want to think of the kid's future unless we got to salvage this let him figure it out he'll fi- he'll he will figure it out i guarantee you that and then you know what he'll be back sooner or later and he'll just move on and i guarantee you this will make him a better a better competitor a better pitcher the rest of his career you can bank on that well you are listening to the Gibby show it's presented by Miller Lite and John i'm sure you had uh a few Miller Lights while you're up in Canada during your travels, and now you're back home. And Miller Light is always on the John Gibbons menu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it, 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 I, I enjoy it, man. You know what? There's just something, something about it. At a certain time of day when it tastes like Miller time helps you relax, and you know what? Watch a good ball game on TV. You know, it's it's the uh, it's a, it's it's the number one brand for baseball anyway, right? It's, uh, exactly so right. It jump on board, sponsor. people. Yeah, so jump on board. Exactly. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite, great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Well, there are some good things to talk about when it comes to the Toronto Blue Jays. I want to talk about Chris Bassett first. Here's a guy, Friday, his wife goes into labor. He's scheduled to pitch, and he's going to fly up to Toronto right after his game. And the game is delayed. Rain delay, hour and a half. All right, so you're like, is he going to make the start or not? And I was rooting for Bassett because I know how intense he is. He goes out there, and he dominates the Mets. He dominates them 
goes into the eighth inning, shutout, shutout ball, gets on a private plane, hops up back to Toronto, and gets there in time for the birth of his baby, who was delivered on Saturday. What a great performance that was, first of all. Yeah, yeah. That's that, you. You don't think they'll, he'll remember that start the rest of his life because his, his child was. Well, I think she. Well, they no. She delivered, I guess, the next day, right? Was it wasn't right away? But the next that, day wasn't that night. That, no, she. That's waited. that's, <laughs> that's going to be another chapter in the old book there for Chris. But uh, I say we, we got to salute his wife, man, for uh, we do saying saying, "Honey, go out there and pitch." Mine would have said, "Get your butt home, man. You got me in this predicament." You know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know I'll what? Wait. Uh, I'll wait till you, you know, get here, honey. You know, uh, Chris is the ultimate competitor, man. You, the more you oh, see him, the more you like him. And obviously, you saw him last year. And uh, you know, you talk. You you, you met. You were crying about the Mets getting shut down, this and that, and blah blah blah. You know, sometimes that's what good pitching does to you. You know, oh. you, you, in, in the, you know they 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 had three great solid starts. You know, the Met, the Mets pitchers did. And uh, and they got just enough offense that they needed. It wasn't like they they blew out the Mets necessarily. So, but it was just good pure baseball. It, it, it really was. And the Mets are on a little bit of a roll. I hate to be. I told you so. But on the show last week, we were talking about whether you know the the Blue Jays are done. The season's over. No, they'll get on. They, they were at home and they're going to get on a nice little roll here. The the schedule was kind of maybe setting up in their favor a little bit. Yep, and uh, that's just what they've done. Now, last, last night's probably a uh, aberration because uh, you know when when uh, the first game against the Astros, now they got Gosman going and and you, and you name it. So they they they're 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 positioned to go on a nice little roll. Oh, and, absolutely, uh, hang, I hang mean, in this uh, thing. And it's something about Gosman too. I mean, because he's done so well, and now you're hearing the you know quietly he's kind of being talked about, you know, for Cy Young this year, and he's gone about his business very quietly very methodically and he's performed. Yeah. Well, yeah, he should be considered the Cy Young, you know, yeah. you, know you look at it, you know, when, from his days in Baltimore where they finally had to move him because they ran out of time, whatever, to, when he really came into his own, became a pitcher. He's been as good as anybody, right? I mean, he's, he's oh, yeah. And now, uh, you know, when you, when you're talking about the Cy Young, you, you gotta, you gotta really dominate a category. And you look at his strikeouts, man, because strikeouts are like homers, you know, chicks dig homers, they dig strikeouts. So, and I got a you great stat here when it comes to his, his strikeouts. I mean, he has struck out 282 batters in his first 40 starts as a Blue Jay, second most in franchise history, just under Roger Clemens. Uh, 2023 so far, uh, he is 4-3. and three. He's got 100 Ks already uh, this season, and he seems to be getting stronger as the season progresses. So uh, things are looking really good for, for Kevin Gosman. Yeah, well, you know, bottom line, you know, they signed him for a lot of money because he is good. And, and uh, you know, you look at that whole rotation has really stepped up for this team. You know, uh, you know, other than the problems that Alec is having right at the moment, you know, uh, Gosman, Bassett, uh, Barrios, and Kikuchi, right? I mean, yeah, and yeah, and we're, we're go, going together. in. They there, there was question marks about uh, the last two, so uh, yeah, they're in a, they're in a good spot right now. They they are. They'll. Uh, you know, they got to you know, wipe away that first game against the Astros. They got a chance to win these next three out of four. That's why they say you got to turn the page. You got to turn the page yeah. and look ahead. That's why there's 162 games to play. Yes. And, you know, hey, Springer hit the home run the other day. Lead not, didn't he tie Soriano? Leading off second pitch of the game against Verlander. And Verlander pitched 114 uh, uh, pitches. He went into the eighth inning, the longest uh, stretch, and he gave up the one run, and, he, you know, they couldn't win. They couldn't score. It was just like it was. Uh, they got shut down all weekend long. Yeah. Hey, hey welcome to the American League. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That'll wrap up the leadoff, and now it's time for gabbing with Gibby's, brought to you by Tim Hortons, and uh, in celebration of National Donut Day, which was June the second. Uh, Gibby was actually up there for National Donut Day uh, in 2013. John, a legend, retired from Tim's restaurants, but fans were craving for its return, and Tim's has delivered. The Walnut Crunch is back. Don't miss out. Rock your taste buds with the Walnut Crunch Back Tour. Order now at participating Tim Hortons restaurants. John, you're up hey. there for National Donut Day. Hey, and I'm a big fan of donuts, man. I, I, I had me a couple of those. Don't kid yourself. 
Yeah, they're really good. I, I don't know why they retired that thing. They should have kept that thing around. Maybe it's they put it in the Donut Hall of Fame or something. But it's well worth it. I had a couple of them, and my uh, waistline well, uh, shows it. Well, they're back, and everyone can enjoy the Walnut Crunch, brought to you by Tim Hortons. Today on Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons, we are happy to bring on someone who has experienced just about everything in the game of baseball and in the history of the Blue Jays. He's a former catcher for Toronto, a former manager for Toronto, and one of the most respected broadcasters in the game. He's the current Jays announcer, Mr. Buck Martinez. Buck, welcome to Gabbing with Gibby. Thank you very much, John. Good to be with you. Gibby, great to see you. It's been a while now, man. Hey, yeah, Buck, it's been, it's been too long, pal. You know, I, I, st- I still, uh, well, our show primarily focuses on the Blue Jays, you know, so I, I watched quite a few games, man, and love listening to you. Always have. And, you know, I was telling these guys earlier, and I said, you know, when you're around Buck, you know, even like when I was managing you were in the booth, Buck's one of those guys, since he's done everything, he's he's like a sounding board for you, you know, and he could discuss the game with you. He'd give you, give you, give you some ideas on maybe this or that. And it's in in uh, that was very valuable to me. And in as great as that, the description John gave of what you've done in the game, you're an even better guy, man. And and uh, and you gave me my first start in the big leagues as, as a coach. Uh, and it, it uh, you know, I never forget that. You know why? I've been very fortunate to be in the game a long time. And I, I think you you and I both have the idea that when you start to play the game, we only play because we love it. And I don't think any of us set out to say, well, I'm going to make this my whole career. This is going to be my whole life. But we've been very fortunate to have a career in baseball. And here I am, uh, you know, I, I think this is my 53rd year in the game, something like that. Some ridiculous number, but I've been very fortunate. I I signed and left California in 1967. I've been on the road ever since. <laughs> uh, you're, you're right. You know, my, my thing was is, is – uh... I had to stay in the game because I couldn't find anything else to do. Nobody in the real world was trying to hire me to do anything. So. <laughs> uh, but I, hey, I can remember, you know, I got that. I was, I was your bullpen catcher uh, when, when I came over there. You know, I came over with J.P. Ricciardi. And, you know, it was everybody kind of knew how things were going, right? Because you could bring a new GM, you know, and the manager. Same thing I experienced, you know, when Atkins and, and uh, Shapiro came over. You know, when things went bad, I was out. You know, and that, that, I get it. Um, but so I, was, I, you know, I tell people I'm, I wasn't the bullpen coach; I was the bullpen catcher. So I'd get down there every night, right? And I, and I, dude, hey, Buck, I felt so bad for you because I said we got we have no pitching. I mean, we we've got our starting pitching stinks. We got nobody in the bullpen. I said, what the heck's Buck gonna do? And I and I was a poor sob that had to get down on a knee and get it loose every night. So so hey, I felt your pain, brother. <laughs> but I appreciate the opportunity. We can't play this game without pitching, and uh, I don't care how long we watch games or how much the game has changed. It's all about pitching, and uh, everybody wants it to be about offense and big numbers and hitting home runs, but the teams that win year in and year out, they pitch. And Dusty Baker's here now with us in Toronto with the Astros, and of course they won the World Series last year. And the reason they won the World Series was he did such a great job of keeping his bullpen fresh. And when they got to the postseason, they had the best bullpen in the postseason, and they just mowed through the whole organizations and did a great job to win the World Series. And, uh, you know, it, it's still I'm all about pitching. If you can't pitch, you can't play. Exactly. And, and you know what, Buck, With the the problem with all that is nowadays with all the analytics, right? And, I, hey, numbers don't lie. We all get that. But there's there's got to be a balance. But what they do with starting pitchers or what they're expected to do or what they're told to do, these managers – you kill bullpens, you know, and I think that, like you said about Dusty, Dusty comes from, he, he's got that mentality. Hey, I'm going to watch how that starter's doing, and I'm going to let him roll with it while he's good. And he's he's also conscious of the bullpens. Now they burn through that starter. Five, it's you remember it used to they used to make fun of starting pitchers back then in the five and dive. This guy's a five and diver, right? He'll go oh, five, yeah. and if you got the lead, he's out of there. And and that was a curse if they, they put that title on you. Now it's like you're hoping to get five out of these guys, and then the bullpen's got to eat up at least another four. So that's what I think was really good about Dusty because, yeah, he 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 let the game play out. You know what's interesting, John, and, and, you know, there's so much money in the game now, and they've invested so much in technology and analytics and all of the rap soto and, and all the different things they have at their disposal. 
Show me who's better. Who is better because of all of this? I don't see anybody that's better. There's no Steve Carlton's. There's no Nolan Ryan's. There's no uh, Sandy Koufax's. And it, nobody's better. Yeah, they've got a lot of these people. You know, when you fly on a charter now, there are more associates than there are players. They have more people <laughs> catered to the players than everybody else. And, and the players aren't any better. You know, I would buy into analytics if you could prove to me that analytics has made the game better. But it's not any better. You know that. You watch games. And, and you and I came up at a time, and I came up before you, obviously. But we came up at a time when you saw what was going on in the field. And if a guy was dealing, you let him pitch. And if he wasn't dealing, Johnny Padres, the old pitching coach for Jim Fergosi, had a great line. Fergosi would lean over and say, how many pitches does he have? And Padres would say, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's so true. You know, they, they used to they used to say, "Hey, this guy manages too much with his gut." No, it's it's not your gut, man. It's your eyes, man. Your eyes will tell you what's going on in the game, and then you yeah. factor in the score. Where they, they let's milk as much as we can out of this guy because them them boys out in the bullpen they're smiling, go, "Thank you, thank you, thank you." Give us a break, you know. So, right. but the game's yeah. definitely changed. The hitters always would tell you when it's time to take a pitcher out. You know that, and it's uh, and nowadays they they. They have a predetermined time when the guy's coming out of the game. And, you know, Chris Bassett threw a complete game shutout not long ago, and it was like, wow, how did he do that? Well, he doesn't throw 98. He throws eight different pitches, and he just pitches. And, uh, you know, the essence of pitching is to keep the hitter off balance. And, uh, you know, you came up with the Mets when they were all about pitching, and they had some great pitchers, and they would go out there. Chris Carpenter told me, and, and you were with us, we had Carp, and, and Carp said, my job as a starting pitcher is to win the game. Well, now because of analytics, they have de-emphasized what winning is. They say wins don't matter. Wins matter to the manager. Oh. You mean- <laughs> 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 you're darn right. I, I, you know what else is interesting, Buck? I can remember when I came up with the Mets, you were talking about the Mets pitching. Davey Johnson was a manager, right? And I, and I asked him, because there was a few times early in the season – he would, he left the starter in, he'd go out to the mound to talk or what have you. And, see, and I was talking to him one day and he says, he says, this is what I do. He says, early in the season, I'll give these guys a couple chances to work out of their own mess, right? Whether it be the starter or even if he brings in a reliever, I'll give them maybe a hitter or two more. And you know what? They, they'll show me whether they can do this or not. So, you know what? If, if they get it done, we got them. We got, we got a better pitcher. You know, I can rely on this guy. If they don't get it done, Next time I go to take them out, they can't say a damn word. They can't bitch at all because, hey, I've given you a chance. And you prove you couldn't do it, you know. And, but that's common sense baseball instead of automatically just jerking a guy. You know, it's like – but, right. but hey, maybe, we're, maybe we're old-fashioned. We are old-fashioned. But like I said, prove to me that the game is better. And when you see Bruce Bochy coming back into the game and Dusty Baker coming back into the yeah. game, Joe they're coming back into the game. And you know what? All of these guys that are running these teams now, they're all Ivy Leaguers. All the GMs are from the Ivy League schools in Harvard and Princeton and Dartmouth and Yale, and they're all Ivy Leaguers, and they're supposed to be smart. Well, if you're so smart, how come there are so many players injured? And how come there are so few pitchers that that are good pitchers? I talked to David Cohen about this the other day, and, and David talked about, I learned how to pitch in the minor leagues. Now we're asking pitchers to learn how to pitch in the big leagues, and that's impossible. Yeah. Just can't do it because you have to have the experience. And what happens is a lot of these minor league teams, and it's industry wide, it's not one team or the other, it's across the industry because everybody's using the same information. So they say, well, a pitch limit is 100 pitches. Whoever determined that? Dr. Andrews has always said, we don't know what 100 pitches is. And Maddox has always said, I can throw 88 pitches in an intense one to nothing game and be exhausted. Or 150 pitches in a game where I'm breezing and never break a sweat. So every game, every pitch, every inning is different. And you can't have a script for each and every baseball game because every one of them is different. It is. And that's, you know what, that's 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 what's lost, you know. Hey, you know what, you talk about these guys that, uh, hey, and, and, and God bless them, you know, they get there, they, they, that are running these teams. With their, their and they're Ivy making a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the, the Ivy League, you know, the backgrounds. And I was, I, I said to this one executive, uh, it was two years ago, I was out scouting with the Braves, right? 
and I and I asked him, I said, "Where'd you go to school?" And he said, it was an Ivy League school. I said, and I said, now you're doing this? And they said, yeah. I said, I love it. I said, I said, gee, gee your parents must be, really be disappointed. They spent all that money on an Ivy League education, and you're doing this crap now? I said, God, <laughs> they must have disowned you, you know? So you, should, you ought to be working to try to own the team, not run it. <laughs> exactly. And that's what, uh, you know, the, that's like my son wanted to get into the front office and everything else. I said, and Casey played in the minor leagues. And I said, Casey, there's only two players who make money in baseball. Two people, the players and the owners. Everybody in between doesn't make money. <laughs> <right. laughs> oh, that's beautiful. All right, real quick. Okay, now since we're talking about pitching, right? You know, you've been watching Alec Manoa. You know, uh, last year you had a chance to win the Cy Young, and it's been a, it's been a rough go. Obviously, we had him on our show last fall when things were going well. You love everything about the kid, you know. But it's been a battle this year. I mean, it, this has happened before. I mean, that's why the game of baseball is so is so hard. It's happened to other players. Everybody and their brothers trying to figure figure out what's wrong. I'm sure, obviously. What do you, what do you think is going on? Is it because he the innings jump he made because they didn't throw enough innings in the minor leagues, like you mentioned, or he couldn't be hurt, or they wouldn't be throwing him out there? I wouldn't think, right? What, you, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know what? It's so so difficult, and like you say, and and you know Pete Walker, he pitched for you, and he was on that team, and um, he was, you know, he's a great pitching coach. I think Pete's one of the best pitching coaches in the game because he yeah he's great at finishing off pitchers. Like he's done it with Robbie Ray, he did it with Stephen Matz, he did it with Ron Springer. They all came here and they left a better pitcher. But if you think about the situation now with Alec Manoa, here's a guy that's what. Two and a half years, he had great success. He only pitched 35 innings in the minors. So the Blue Jays didn't really develop him at all. He was developed at West Virginia University. So he came in, pitched, and then had a lot of success. But there's no Christmas to his pitches, and there's no conviction to his pitches. You had a guy in 2005 that had a similar start in Ted Lilly. And, you know, Ted turned out to be a pretty good pitcher, but he went through a rough stretch. And I look at a list of guys that have gone through similar stretches for the Blue Jays. It's amazing. Jack Morris, Dave Steeb, Pat Henkin, Juan Guzman, uh, Roy Halladay, they all went through stretches like this at some point. And then it's up to the individual to say, I got to do something different. And, you know, Roy Halladay went through it and he came back a Hall of Famer. But it was on the player and the player made the changes and the player made the adjustments. But, you know, one thing, Alec is a big guy. You know, they say he weighs 260. Who knows how much he weighs? He looks bigger to me this year than he was last year. But we okay. give these guys so much credit. And you know this from your experience. Just because they're major leaguers, we believe they have all of the things figured out. And they believe it too. This is a very difficult game to play. You know, I mentioned Jack Morris, and he had his ups and downs. And he ends up in the Hall of Fame. Pat Henkin had his ups and downs, yeah. and he ended up a Cy Young Award winner. But it's a very difficult game to play. And when you have success like Manoa's had this first two years of, the, of his career, everybody wants to knock you off that mound because you have had your way with them. Now it's reversed a little bit, and he hasn't been able to stop it. I don't think you can continue to pitch him in the big leagues right now. I think he needs a break. Uh, I don't think he's hurt. I, I think, you know, obviously you can option him to the minor leagues, but the problem the Blue Jays have is they don't have anybody to take his place. All of the guys they got in the offseason that they hope would be starter number six, seven, eight, nine, they are not doing anything in the minor leagues, and there's just nobody there. But my thought is Tampa Bay does it with an opener, and they have, you know, they've got a couple of real good starters, they lost Glass now up until the last couple of starts. They lost Drew Rasmussen probably for the rest of the season. They got Shane McClanahan, who's a terrific pitcher. And then every once in a while, they'll run Josh Fleming out there, and now he's hurt. So Fleming will be a bulk pitcher after a, an opener out of the bullpen. So Blue Jays are going to have to do that. They're in a position yeah. where they have three more off days in the month of June, so they can work around a four-man rotation and use the bullpen probably a couple of days so I, I don't think you can send Manoa back out there pitching the way he is right now because all it's going to do is continue to challenge his confidence. Yeah. No, you know, I, I, agree, I agree with you. We, we were talking about it earlier. You know, you always hope that, okay, you send him out this night, it, it clicks, all right, and everything comes together. 
but then, but it's been going on for a few starts now, uh, multiple starts where it really hasn't, you know, that hasn't happened. And it's like, now you risk the, take the risk of losing him here. Right. If you keep doing it. Right. And, it, and it, so send, send him down. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody, we all, we've been in that chair. You don't want to have to do that, especially a kid that's been so successful. It's, it's at the start of his career. But if you don't, you know, you may not, you may never get him back. I mean, that's, that's how tough the game is to play. So, and even if, even if those guys in the minor leagues, yeah, they may not be ideal, but they're going to give you what he's giving you right now. Exactly. Right. And then maybe you can just do like a round Robin. Somebody, yep. somebody gets on a little roll, wins a cover, gives you a couple good outings and you run with it. Hey, bring uh, old Drew Hutchinson. Remember old Hutchinson resurfaced? You know, maybe you uh, bring him in there, you know, it, uh, who knows, but you know, cause we're all pulling for Manoa, you know, uh, but it's a humbling game. It's a very humbling game. And you know what it is? It's professional sports and it's all about winning. And if you don't do whatever you can do to win, you know, somebody's going to uh, lose their job. And you and I have both been in that situation where if you don't win, um, you, you're going to be out. And, you know, result. this is a results-oriented industry. If you don't have results, you can't participate. And right now he's not getting the results. Right. You know, you mentioned Drew Hutchison. Unfortunately, he just opted out of this contract in AAA, so he's not in the organization right now. And uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, he, he left, and he wasn't pitching very well either. Casey Lawrence right. has got eight ERAs. Zach Thompson has got a ten ERA. Uh, Bowden Francis, they're talking about. He's only thrown seventeen innings all season. So you know, if they start Trevor Richards and bring Thomas Hatch up, maybe Trent Thornton comes back. But unfortunately. This organization is paper thin right now, and not only in pitching, but in position players as well. You know, they brought Danny Jansen on the I.L., and now they have uh, Tyler Hanneman back to back him up, and uh, they had him once before, and they got him back because they're they're thin, and they're thin in position. Yeah. They're thin in pitching, and knock on wood, they've been relatively healthy. But if they lose Gosman or Bassett or Bo or Gladdy, the season might be over for them. And it's a very difficult time. And uh, you know what? I, I think that they have to do something now, next time through the rotation, just to tell the players we're doing whatever we can because this team is supposed to be a World Series contender. And right now, they certainly don't look like it. Oh, my God, the walnut crunch! It's crunch time. Ooh. Ooh. The Walnut Crunchback Tour is coming to a Thames near you. What do you got, Johnny? What do you got for Buck? Well, I mean, uh, as Buck was saying, uh, this team was built to win now. Um, and getting started this season, it's been kind of a roller coaster ride. Do you think that you think they still got World Series potential for this year, or do they need to add something like a power bat or an arm going forward as uh, the trade deadline comes uh, into play? Well, John, everybody would like to have a starter. I don't think there's a team in the world that would say, okay, we're fat, we're, we're good at starters. You know, Pat Gillick always would say you need 8 to 10, 12 starters to get through a season. The Blue Jays have only used five starters this year. They're the only team in baseball that has only used five starters, but that's going to have to change because it just can't continue like this. But, uh, you know, it's easy to say, well, yeah, we need, uh, we need to bring in something. We need to bring a spark, but there, there are no sparks in the system. And, and give you you'll remember when you had a player in the minor leagues and, and you say, okay, well, we can call this guy up and he might give us a little spark because he's hot right now. Well, there aren't any of those players down in the minor league system. But you know what? And you think about getting back to Manoa a little bit. Edwin and Connor Schoen got sent down to the minor leagues. And, you know, he took it the right fashion. He came back and he became a great slugger and had a wonderful career. Okay, Oscar Hernandez got sent down to the minor leagues. Kevin Pillar got sent down to the minor leagues. You remember that? And, uh, you know, he came back a better player because of it. And, uh, you know, this happens. Uh, the road to the Hall of Fame is not always a straight and narrow one. There are a lot of bumps. In <laughs> and that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, Buck, that was kind of the norm. You know, you, very few guys take it by storm. You know, when you got there, I don't think you ever got sent back down, though, did you? Oh, yeah, I did. You got the Oh, yeah. Did you, man? You got when you got there. You were like a, you were like still a teenager, man, and you played all that that long time. But yeah, that was kind of the norm, you know. You you go up if you're not producing, next, next, next. Yeah. But there was there was there was a bunch of players there waiting, you know, to that to, to take your job, right? 
and and you were stuck in uh, in New York behind some pretty good players too, and it was always difficult. And then you got hurt, and uh, you know you you didn't never really had a chance to to realize your potential. But you know you just never know what's going to happen, and you never know who might be the next guy. I mean, you know, we have seen guys come out of the woodwork where we didn't expect them. Well, how come this guy's successful? Well, you know, he just had a great run. He, timing was right. He got to the big leagues when he was hot. And he just ran with it. And, and yeah. we've got those stories as well. Exactly. Well, hey, all right. So so what you've seen from the league the league now. Uh, hey, what, real quick, though, what, what, do, what do you think of the uh, pitch clock? Is it is – it, I know the games are faster. I know there's been some complaining about, well, is it affecting certain pitchers? Are you a fan of it? I, I know, man, you, you don't have to sit up in that booth for so damn long every night. I know that. But uh, is it? you think it's been successful to this point pretty much? Yeah, I, think it, I think it's worked very well. And I think what it's done is it's it made people realize that the game is, is not that that slow. You, and it, it's there's been a lot of studies done on the impact of the pitch clock. And, and I think – the, the numbers suggest that it has not been a factor at all. It hasn't really affected that many people, and that's the way okay. we play the game. The pitcher would get the ball, and he'd step on the rubber and say, come on, let's go. And the pitcher always set the tempo for the game, and they would stand out there. And, and you know, the great pitchers, Drysdale and Colfax and Bob Gibson, they wanted to get the game over in a hurry. And I'm in charge of this game. You step in the box. And, you know, Dennis Eckersley had one of the great lines in the history of baseball. He was throwing a no-hitter against the Angels, and Gil Flores stepped out of the box a couple of times, and Eckersley walked off the mound, pointed to home plate, and says, listen, I'm throwing a no-hitter. You're the last out. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> and that's what pitchers always – they always dictated the tempo of the game, and then there was a time when hitters took over, and Manny Ramirez and George Bell and all these guys would take their time and step out of the box. Oh, yeah. Time up and everything. You know, there was a great time in the Kansas City when George Bell was hitting against Buddy Black and he stepped out a couple of times and he held his hand up to the umpire and said, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And Buddy Black was standing on the rubber waiting to pitch and he stepped out another time and put his gloves together and Buddy Bell finally cranked one up and landed one right in his ribs and hit him with the first pitch. And he came back on the bench and George sat next to me and goes, He hit me on purpose, no? <laughs> I go, Yeah, he <laughs> Sure oh did. god, the game is so different now. You know, but that reminds me too. We just had that the the, the deal up there in, in Toronto with uh, uh, Judge, right? Oh yeah, yeah. the uh, pitching. Yeah. And you, you guys, you got yeah, yeah. You guys spotted that right up there in the booth, right? And yeah. And then uh, then the old argument. Well, I was looking at in the dugout to keep these guys, uh, or they were they were distracting. <laughs> I think we're thinking we must have idiots, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I got to tell you what I I, I thought, you know, there, there was a chance for the Blue Jays to gain the upper hand right there, right? You know, Judge got away with it; he ends up hitting a couple more home runs. And uh, nobody's advocating the way you got to drill guys, or nobody likes to see that. But they say, well, okay, well, the the first base coach, the guy, he's it's not illegal, okay? Yeah, a lot of things aren't illegal, but sometimes you got to do you do them at your own peril, right? That okay, it 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 may not be illegal. But it's kind of bush league, or it's affecting us. It's, it may lead to to beating us. Then we got to handle it our own way too. So just be ready. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and I think you're right. And Blue Jays had a chance to make a statement right there, and they they didn't, and they went on for the rest of the series, and they continued to hit him. And you know what? We saw it right away, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. What the heck is he looking at? And we never said. He's cheating. We never said, but I said, he's looking for something and he's getting something. Yeah. From something. And, you know, it's not on the mound and he's not looking in the dugout. So, you know, and, and they, you know, and then Aaron Boone says, well, anybody that knows baseball knows nothing was going on. Well, Aaron, oh. <laughs> it's just the opposite. <laughs> what was going on. But you know what? And, and this is what Buck Showalter always says about the showboating and the map flips and everything else. He said, you know, I'm old school as anybody, but if it doesn't affect my players, why should I worry about it? And it didn't affect the players. That's what got me. I mean, you and I know, and, and you know, and it doesn't even, not even Nolan Ryan, anybody would have done it when, hey, Pete Vukovic walked back 
I played in Milwaukee with the best sign stealing team I ever played with. With Bando and Heisel and Yount and Molander and Cooper and Don Money and all those guys. And everybody could steal the sign. And, and Sal used to tell me, listen, kid, your job is to get to second base and give me location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all you got to do. But finally, Pete Bukovic called us out one day. He walked back to second base and said, if you guys give one more location, I'm hitting the next guy in the head. Okay. We'll start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody, you know, we're always looking for things. I mean, guys use cork bats, guys use pine tire, guys cheated as much as they could until they got caught. And when they got caught, the other team took care of it. The league didn't take care of it. The players took care of it. And you know what? You have a couple of lumps in your ribs and that hurts and you stop it. But, you know, nowadays it's a different story. Everybody wants to be friends and, and you know, it's 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 not the same game. No, cause this is serious business, you know? I mean, you're trying to win. I mean, it's all about winning. Because like you said earlier, who gets whacked, man? The manager's going to get whacked well, and this really coaching staff. The they... record is the manager. <laughs> <laughs> Coaches don't have a win-loss record. The manager's got a win-loss record. So, you know, you tell me wins don't matter? They matter to the manager. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Well, what's hey, – uh, if we're watching all the teams out there, obviously Tampa's got off to an incredible start. Is there any any real shockers to you? I know Bal- maybe it's Baltimore ahead of the game a little bit. Or, uh... I don't know if it's a shock or not, but we saw this coming last year with the Baltimore Orioles. They're a pretty good yeah. team. And you know what? Not only do they have a good team in the big leagues right now, they've got some kids knocking on the door, including Matt Holliday's son, Jackson Holliday, who has uh, just been named a player mm-hmm. of the month in A-ball. And uh, I-, I think he's 19. He might even be 18. Man, This is his first pro season, and he's tearing it up. But uh, he, hey, uh, wait a minute! Time out! Time out! He's he just the uh, player of the month at A ball yeah. at nineteen. Yeah. Well, you were in the big you were in the big leagues at nineteen. Where, 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 where's where's the? I thought, well, didn't we just talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and they're, they're, Baltimore Baltimore's a good team, and uh, they've been a good team since yeah. they called up catcher Adley Rutschman. And uh, when he came up last May, okay. they had taken off, and he's a, he's a leader. He reminds me a lot of Ted Simmons. A switch hitting catcher with leadership skills behind the plate. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. Uh, Texas is good. You see them, I'm sure. Yeah. The Rangers are really good. They can hit. Uh, Chris Young, who's a, who's a GM, happens to be an Ivy Leaguer, but he's also a former player. And uh, he's yeah. bringing those guys in there in Texas. And uh, they've got a pretty good pitching staff. And uh, Seeger and uh, Simeon are doing what everybody expected they would do offensively when they signed them. Okay, that's good. Hey, you know what's fu- funny? And when was it? It was at the end of uh, it was the end of January, I think, or right at the beginning of February. Dayton Moore, the old GM for the Kansas City Royals, just a great baseball man. He got got fired by the Royals last year. He went down there. He's like an assistant for Young now with the Rangers. He called me. I was out to dinner. He called me and said, "Hey, uh, we got something for you." I said, "I said what is it?" He says, "We want you to go manage our AAA team in Round Rock in the in the." Uh, you know, it's about an hour. It's about an hour, hour and a half from San Antonio. And he and I said, really? You know, he said, yeah. We you know we we brought Bochi in. We got it. We got a good bunch of players there. We want to kind of get back to maybe a little bit of that old school type mentality. And you know, whatever, whatever right? We're looking for somebody's experience. And so I said, well, let, let me think about that, right? So so I went home and I talked to my wife, and I thought, and I gave it some serious thought, and I thought, you know what? I might, I might do this. So I scheduled to get on a plane, go up there, meet with Chris Young and, and his in his group. That morning, I called him. I said, "You know what? In all fairness to them, I don't think I could give them the effort that they need." You know, so I told him, "You know, you're better off getting somebody else." I'm not sure who they end up hiring, but they called, and I, I was impressed. You know, I I had I'd known Young, I really, I really didn't know him, but I met him. Mm-hmm. But Dayton Moore is always one of my guys, man. You know, he yeah. just like just he's. Just an old throwback, right? So I said, if it's good enough for him, if he thinks I'm enough of me, but I, I didn't do it. Now I look now, and, and I thought, you know, that's a, that's a good group to be a part of over there because they they got they got smarts, but yet they got that 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 old, that old mentality too, you know. Absolutely, and you know, the game is still the game, and the game is played on the field. Yes, you cannot predict anything that uh, a computer spits out because the game is about humans. And, you know, all of the analysts and all of the people that are pushing all this information believe that baseball is a science. But we know that we have played baseball as an art. And it is truly an yes. art. You're on the field and you perform and, and guys see things. And 
when you see Robbie Alomar play second base and he instinctively throws the ball in a double play situation to third and not first, trying to get the guy rounding third, those things you can't teach. Those are innate reactions and baseball instincts that, that are passed from generation to generation. And you know what? I, I don't know that the players play enough competitive baseball nowadays to really understand that before they get to the big leagues. Because Dusty Baker told me last night, he said, I'm teaching constantly every day about you got to back up this play. You've got to watch the scoreboard and know when you can steal. You've got to understand the game. And, and all of that was taught in the minor leagues before. But now, because of the minor leagues and because they're cost-cutting, uh, so, you know, you don't have the John Gibbons managing in AAA that could pass along that major league experience. And you know what? I think the most important manager in a system is the rookie league manager, the guy that gets yes. the the first time. And he says, okay, this is how we're going to dress. And, you know, the Yankees get ridiculed for having the same uniforms and having all of those the restrictions about mustaches and beards and hairdo and everything else. Well, how are they making out? They make out pretty damn good every year. And they have standards. And and the word itself, that what people wear is a uniform. Everything is uniform. This is how we do it. Yeah. The Dodgers did it. The Cardinals did it for years. The Royals used to do it all the time. The Yankees do it. The Baltimore Orioles, the Oriole way with uh, Cal Ripken Sr. You know, there was just a certain way you did things. And I don't think there's enough tradition in the game for organizations to establish that. The Big Red Machine, the Cincinnati Reds, they always had standards. They wore ugly uniforms and ugly black shoes, but they beat your ass every day. And it was because they were uniform and they had a way of playing baseball. And I think we've gotten away from that because we want to let the kids be kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, well, well, hey, you know what? Uh, we've said this many times on the show. I think, you know, the, I like some of the moves that the Blue Jays made in the offseason, but I think the best move they made all year, all, all winter, was getting rid of that damn home run jacket. That thing used to get going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The sunflower seeds and home run jacket. You know, it's like, really? And yeah. you know, I used to talk to my son about this. And, you know, in college baseball, you know, they have all kinds of celebrations and everything else. And I said, you know what? Yeah. You guys, I, I go back. I hit a home run in the 12th inning. I didn't hit many home runs. But I hit a home run in the 12th inning of a scoreless game against the Tigers in 1985. 84, I believe, when the Tigers were rolling. It was right. a nothing cool. game. 12th inning. I had a two-run home run to win it in the 12th inning. And when I got the home plate, there was only one guy there. That was the guy that was on base. We walked back to the dugout. Everybody shook hands. We went inside and had a cold beer and celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it, it's like a, old goats. That's all. We just sound old, Gibby. We're just old. Oh, yeah, well, you know what? It, it, uh, I, but it, it just kind of turned into a circus, you know. Especially you losing by ten runs, somebody hits a solo home run, and, and it's like, okay. But I, like you said, let the boys play, I guess, you know. But, but if that's what we talk about, you know. Dusty Baker winning it all last year, Bochy back in the game. Uh, you know, it's it's good. It's it maybe it's it's a great combination. The the new and the older a little bit, you know. Absolutely. I think it'd be good for the game. Well, listen, Buck, man, it's always a pleasure, pal. We re we appreciate you taking the time, and, and uh, we know you got a grueling schedule and got another game to call tonight. So, uh, But tell the boys hello for us. I sure will, Gimme. I'm glad you feel great. You, yeah. Thank you very much. You're, right. you're, you look great, man. And it, uh, I appreciate you get, helping me get, a, get my start in the game, too, as a coach. I appreciate All that. Right. I never forget that. John, great to be with you. All right, okay. pal. Joe, sure, and uh, you guys have a great day. Thank you, too. Good luck. What a pleasure that was just to watch you and Buck uh, just talk baseball and uh, old school guys with a lot of similarities. That was wonderful, John. That was great. <laughs> See, old school guys are just old guys. Yeah, you know what? Hey, uh, Buck's one of the best, but he's a great human being. Nobody's more knowledgeable about the game than he is. You know, just you just look look at his career. So, uh, and, and you know what? He gave me my start, and I'm, uh, uh, I love the guy.
Yeah, I could just see the chemistry between both of you, and I really enjoy just listening to you. Uh, both are legends in my book, and it was it was a great conversation. Uh, so that was really really cool to see that. But now, inspired by our friends over at Miller Lite, let's get the roast and toast for the week. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite, great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. And John, I asked you a favor. I said, listen, can I actually roast somebody this week? And you said, Johnny, go ahead. So I'm going to roast Buck Showalter, the manager of the New York Mets. I think uh, he, 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 uh, a lot of bad decisions in this uh, Blue Jay series. How do you, how do you not intentionally walk Vladdy Guerrero in a tie game? I don't understand it. And then, of course, Vladdy comes through and gets the game winning hit down the third baseline. They asked Buck after the game, well, and every, everyone was like, why didn't you walk Vladdy? Well, I was thinking about the 10th inning. I mean, Johnny, you ever, <laughs> have, did you ever do anything like that? Oh I, oh, I guarantee I've done some bonehead things. But, hey, you sound like a typical New Yorker for crying out loud. No, uh, no, I, 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 I got to <laughs> I gotta agree with you on this one. In, in, uh, I'm a little bit surprised. But I will say this because, you know, I'm part of that, that click. You know, everybody's got their reasons for doing things, right? And, uh, but you know, there's, there's certain things that come up, you're going to get grilled about. And that's one of them, you know, because all you got to do is really, you look at, you know, they had, uh, Biggio was on deck. He'd gone into yeah. pinch run for belt as I think it, that would happen. So, so you, all right, what am I, I don't care who he's pitching your closer, or the, whether it's Cy Young or not, you know, Vladdy's one of the best in the game, best hitters. And then, uh, and so you go with the weaker guy. Yeah, who had the, somebody had a famous quote? What who, who do you want to face? Uh, you know, or they're talking about intentional walks. You know, you you want to basically you want to you want to face the guy that's making the least amount of money, right? Because there's a reason that other guy's making a lot of money, right? Because he's he's productive. Mm-hmm. So, you know what? That's yeah. It, it, that backfired. You know, um, you know, you can't. It did. Win. It backfired big time. It really did. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's who. Uh, and thank you for letting me roast uh, Buck Showalter. Uh, that was, you know, I got a little bit off my chest here, so I feel a little bit better. I had a I had a vent a little bit. But uh, on the other side, I mean, we got to toast somebody that uh, has been so inspirational for baseball. Uh, a baseball researcher for MLB is a young lady named Sarah Langs. And she's beloved in the game by all the executives, by all the teams. She's the go-to person for research and such a bright uh, young woman. She was diagnosed uh, about a year and a half ago with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, and they celebrated Lou Gehrig Day in Major League Baseball uh, this past Friday. So she was honored at Citi Field. Uh, Her phrase is always, baseball is the best. And uh, uh, a team uh, put together a T-shirt. They raised 57000 for Project ALS. And she's so inspirational to be diagnosed with a disease that has no cure. It's a terminal illness. And for this young woman who's so vibrant and the way baseball has rallied around her, uh, we have to give our toast of the week to Sarah Langs. Yeah, great choice, Johnny. You know what? It kind of kind of makes these baseball games not quite as important, right? You know, um, it is, is entertaining. But anytime, I think it's always good to highlight people and bring and focus on the human element and the people behind the scenes. That uh, you know these these are these are men and these are women and and uh, they have lives and they they deal with struggles like everybody else. And um, sometimes we forget that when we're we put them on TV and things like that. And, and she's, like you said, she's a very important part of Major League Baseball. And, and it, this, she's, now she has to deal with this. So everybody's thoughts and prayers are with her. Great, great choice, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you, Gibby. Well, that'll wrap up this edition of the Gibby Show. Don't forget to order a copy of Gibby's book, Gibby Tales of a Baseball Lifer, by Gibby and Greg Oliver. Audio book coming out later this month. For John I Gibby, think it's, I think John it's this Ritz. week. Is it coming out this week? I think so. I guess I better get with the times. I better figure that out. <laughs> well, 
take a look. It's a, it would be available everywhere. That's Gibby Tales of a Baseball Lifer on audio version as well. Uh, for John Gibbons, this is John Arezzi. We'll talk more baseball with you next week right here on the Gibby Show. Have a great week, everyone, and go Blue Jays.